Welcome to Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit, a show that's focused on improving our entire world with a particular focus on the local African-American community. I am super excited. We are in the West End with two West End girls. Yes, myself, Dr. Giovanni Rondo, and I am here with Dr. Marlise Hill Ali. Yay! And she is specifically talking about, on today's episode, health literacy and also telemedicine. Yes. So we're going to just talk to her and just tell us about yourself and your journey into the field of medicine. Yes. Well, I'm happy to be here. Yes. Um, like you said, I'm from the West End, the best end. Yes. Right? Grew up, born and raised here in Louisville. Um, went to Louisville Mill High School, who's actually playing in the football championship. We pray that we win tonight. Oh, yes. tonight? Yes, okay, tonight. okay. Yes. Uh, graduated uh -huh, and uh, went to the University of Kentucky for a few years and then saw the light and came back and graduated from the University of Louisville <laughs> uh, and then went to medical school at the University of Louisville as well. But before I went to medical school, I had a whole, I took the scenic route. I tell people okay, this. Okay. So I didn't take the traditional route mm -hmm. four years in undergrad. So you didn't go, go straight. I you did not go straight. Okay, 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 tell and me about I that. And I tell people, I felt like a preacher running from the calling, right? I knew I was mm. supposed to be a doctor. Mm. If my uncle were here, he'd be like, she announced at kitchen cinder, s Sunday dinner at four years old that I was going to be a doctor. Okay. At four? At four years old, stood up, announced it, and sat back down. <laughs> And my parents wow. were like, okay, that's very nice. But I had great parents because they always encouraged me. Mm -hmm. So my dad sat me down. I was like, you got to be good at math and science. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My mother's like, you got to be diligent, right? So they motivated me. But still, after undergrad, I was like, I don't know if I want to commit to this yet. Mm -hmm, Let me see. Mm -hmm. So I went and I did graduate school at the University of Cincinnati and okay. worked on a Ph.D. in molecular genetics, biochemistry, and microbiology. Wow. Yeah, I did okay. that for two years. Um realized very quickly I was more focused on patient care than mm -hmm. I was on the actual academic nature of all the studies, right? I really wanted to, I was really more concerned about how diseases manifested and what we could do to cure them as opposed to just the curiosity of the disease, right? So mm -hmm. that, that set me apart. And my mentor said, Marlise, I think you should really apply to medical school because you're not really, you know, you don't want to do a PhD. <laughs> so at that point, I moved to Maryland where I got a job at the Institute of Human Virology, which mm. is where Bob Gallo, the co-discoverer of HIV, um, works. That was his institute. He founded at the University of Maryland and got the very exciting opportunity to work on an HIV vaccine that went into clinical development and clinical uh, application in Nigeria uh, when I entered my first year in medical school. So I took the very scenic route. Wow, yeah. an HIV vaccine. Yeah. Uh, what? And this was years ago. This was so, yeah. this was before medical school. Mm -hmm. So I say medical school was my second career mm -hmm. because I I really just felt like I was supposed to be a doctor to to help people with infectious diseases, right? Mm -hmm. So I started very early at 15 thanks to the Lincoln Foundation and Mr. Robinson working wow. in a microbiology lab from the time I was 15 to the time I was 18 years old. Those uh, doctors there, Dr. Doyle, still mentors. They were still mentors when I hit the door of medical school. So I talk to young people all the time, like you, you have no idea who's watching you. Mm -hmm. And yep. you have no yep. idea who's willing to help you, right? Yes. So I started then, got interested and felt like I'm gonna probably go into infectious disease, right? Mm -hmm. But really went into research and found myself really with the, the man who discovered HIV mentoring me directly, telling me, don't worry about that, don't be afraid of that, Marlies, you got this, you do this. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt like the hand of God was on me because who, you know, what is. little girl from the West End Louisville has yes. the opportunity to do that. Yes. Um, and so this vaccine we developed went into clinical trials and it produced a paper for the proceedings of the National Academy of Medicine. And so I have a PNAS and you paper. presented yeah. that? Wow. Yeah, so we have this paper that we did. Came here, went to medical school, uh, was vice president of my class my first year, then got bitten by the research bug again went over to <laughs> Trinidad and did a TB HIV uh, research project there that produced a, a, an abstract that I presented in Orlando for that. Um, 
came back here, finished medical school, and then decided I'm going to stay here and do internal medicine. Again, thinking I'm going to go ahead and go do infectious disease, mm -hmm. right? So, I, of course, as life happens during medical school, I find my husband, we get married, we have mm -hmm. children, right? Mm -hmm. So I definitely, it's a it's been a it's been yeah, a route, yeah, right? Very like, much so. It takes my it took my dad and mom say you never take the easy road. I'm like, no, I want to see <laughs> what life is about. Yeah. So we we get done with residency. I do get an infectious disease fellowship. We move all the way to Jacksonville, and then we Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Florida. Florida. Okay, wow. so I was uh, at the University of Florida Jacksonville in their infectious disease fellowship. Mm -hmm. We were there for probably not even six months when we realized this is not working, okay? Mm -hmm. um, is, I think it's, you know, I don't have to tell you how difficult it is to raise a family. Medicine is a jealous, jealous lover, right? Very and much and so. all things, you know, it, it want, it's a narcissistic lover. It wants your entire life. Absolutely. And I had little kids. All of our kids were under the age of eight. My husband was in his third year of medical school, and I was like, Either we go home where I have support or I'm going to end up in the hospital because yeah, I cannot yeah. continue to do this. Absolutely. And my husband, he says, listen, whatever we need to do. He's a very patient, loving man. Yes. And thank God for Mary Joshua at the University of Louisville. Yes. I picked up the phone and said, Mrs. Joshua, we need mm. to come home. My husband needs to rejoin his class. She says, oh, no problem. We're going into the meeting now. We hadn't even discussed him. I'll just tell him, tell them he's coming back. Again, the hand of God. Wow. On my life, right? Because you know that could have been a disaster. Absolutely, right? absolutely. So your husband was actually in medical school yes. down in Florida. Uh, Florida. He was. And then they accepted him back to the University of they Louisville. Did. Thank you, God. Thank, Thank you, you, Mary God. Joshua. Thank yes. you, University of Louisville. Exactly. Yes. All yes. of the above. Yes. Okay. And so we come back here and we make our life then. And I, I took the traditional road. I didn't go back into the fellowship. I said, I think I could be most useful to my people mm -hmm. if I'm able to go into primary care. Because I can do infectious disease yes. as a primary care yes. doctor, right? Yes. Um, but lots of it, actually. Lots of yeah. it, right? Yeah. But if, I, if we don't get a hold of the basics like cardiovascular disease, uncontrolled diabetes, COPD, mm -hmm. There's, you know, what am I doing, right? I want to make a bigger impact. Mm -hmm. I want to provide a bigger service than just this, than just this More one area. Narrow. Yeah, for me, that was my, my calling. Um, but I love infectious disease. I find mm -hmm. it all interesting. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be more useful to my community. Well, and such a, for such a time as this, <laughs> yes. this is amazing because we're, con we continue to be unfortunately yes. in this pandemic yes. and we find that our people, yes. uh, African Americans in our community have a higher rates, have higher rates of high blood pressure, diabetes, yes. COPD, yes. smoking, and all those obesity also, yes. and all those things play a greater role when it comes to even having infections, not just COVID-19, yes. but infections overall. So you're really, you're still dealing with infectious right. diseases, but you're doing it more of a, in a, I guess a larger, right. you know, venue or whatnot. So right. wow, right. we so need you, you right. know, we so need you and in this community. So, wow, thank you. Well, I'm happy to be here. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, um, most diseases have an inflammation base. We knew that, mm -hmm. right? And I don't mm -hmm. think we have enough information yet to really yep. get to the bottom of it, yep. but we know. So we know that anything that can drive down inflammation, right, can reduce the risk. So things like eating non-inflammatory foods, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not eating lots of fats, Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> processed food, mm -hmm. right? Exercising. Nobody wants to hear this, but exercising. <gasps> and you I mean, I got to go out and get we some get, You got to get out. Yeah. You got to go out and get exercise. Listen, <laughs> I turned 50 last year. Mm. I what? said to myself, wow. I will not be one of those 50 year old women who has bad knees. I'm not going to mm. do that. So mm -hmm. I started paying a trainer. I go to the gym twice a week. I work out at home now. Um, you have to make the wow. conscious choices 
because if you don't, then you'll be reacting to the choices that you make. Yeah, absolutely. So you as a physician mm -hmm. are doing some of the th same things that we, you're basically practicing what you preach. I am. Is that and what you're doing? I, if yeah. I can't do that, then what kind of, a, yeah. you know, to me, I feel like I lose credibility. Yeah, absolutely. And so for, for my patients, and I tell people this, currently I am not a primary care physician. Mm -hmm. I am director of physician leadership for the largest Medicare Advantage company in the United States. Oh, wow. We're okay. in eight states. We cover over 250,000 lives, and we're on pace to cover up to a million lives by 2025. Um, wow. I so your route are, continues, continues to be right? Yeah, continues. yeah. And so people ask me, well, where are you now? Where are you mm -hmm, now? Mm -hmm. I am in a position, and I chose this route because, mm -hmm. again, it's the impact on my community. Mm -hmm. So if I know that my plan is impactful on my, my population, mm -hmm. and then I've been taught that my plan is impactful for a whole market, then God has told me, take your plan and go where you can help more people. Wow. So don't just keep it in this small little bucket, this smaller area just here, no. but just kind of spread that. Wow. The that talent. sounds like a mission. It's the, it's the, yeah. You know, it's the whole story about the talents, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. My grandmother used to tell me all the time, don't bury your talents. And so wow. even though I am very, and you know this about me, I'm very reserved, very introverted. Mm -hmm. I now am in a position where I have to go into different markets and different <laughs> states and, you know, speak with people who are of different ethnicities, different, you know, um, backgrounds. And I laugh about it all the time because it's something I'm completely uncomfortable with. I, I love one of the things Seinfeld said. He says, I could talk to all of you all, but none of you all, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But I can yeah. have a very deliberate conversation when it comes to the health care of our population. And when I say our population, I mean the population that looks like the West End, yes. the people who don't have resources, yes. who don't have people in the family who can explain things to them, the people who don't have an, an advocate to help them explain what it is that they're doing, mm -hmm. someone who is there to help them gather and navigate the healthcare system, which is quite complex. Very much so. Right? Even for physicians. Oh like, my goodness. You know, so yes. I'm sure you've been through some things and I have too Absolutely. that have been really kind of challenging and we're in the system exactly. and it's still hard for us. So just imagine. Exactly. So yeah. So young lady from West Louisville, child from West Louisville mm -hmm. is now impacting just probably millions of people worldwide, but still, you're, you're still able to come here and talk with us, talk to, you know, the people that not only you grew up with, but yes. the people who have watched you grow. Yes, you know, just that's overall, the thing. So. Like, I think people think I play peekaboo, and it's not that. It's just, you know, when mm -hmm. I go into a different direction. So people will say, well, how are you doing where you are? Mm -hmm. And I, I tell them, and, and I want people to know I'm still here. I'm still here as a resource. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm on social media. People can mm -hmm. reach out. Yep. Um, but I am not engaged in direct patient care. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of people who are. I actually do have five nurse practitioners in the community that I have collaborative agreements with. I always refer people to them if they need someone local. Mm -hmm. um, but I think my I see my purpose as being more um, driven toward information okay, and okay. dispelling disinformation. So when you talk about health literacy, Ooh, we need you. <sighs> Absolutely. So let, let's, that's a great segue <laughs> into what this episode is, you know, yes. getting into. And it's about all about health literacy. Yes. Um, what did it what is health literacy and why is it so important right okay so i am going to read this because we are the google generation yep, and yep. we're the wikipedia generation <laughs> and i want people to look this stuff up so if you look on wikipedia the definition okay. says health literacy is the ability to obtain read understand and use healthcare information in order to make appropriate decisions and follow instructions for treatment okay so okay. if we break it down in layman's terms it means how well do you understand your condition? What is used to treat your condition mm -hmm. to make decisions that help you improve or at least not worsen your condition? Okay, okay. Right? So that's like someone who has maybe like high blood pressure sure. or diabetes, being yes. able to kind of understand right. the concept, of, okay, this is what it is, okay, this is why, or this is, um, my, my blood pressure is this number, 
-hmm. and the top number is this and then the bottom number is this but it should I really want to see it down here mm -hmm. and the reason why is because of strokes I, and yeah. heart attacks and mm -hmm. exactly. eye issues exactly like, so being able to take that information up and then apply it and then do some things with exactly. it that um, allow you to live more optimally maybe even not necessarily cure you know high blood pressure but or diabetes worsen. but yeah but not like, worsen it. you know mm -hmm. the person would high blood pressure and CHF you have to watch your salt intake mm-hmm mm-hmm and, and CHF congestive heart failure exactly yep. Yep. thank you congestive yep. heart failure mm -hmm. and these are things that if you're not in a relationship with a doctor that is telling mm -hmm. you these mm -hmm. things you need to find you a doctor yes who will explain this to you I, I cannot stress that enough that we have a choice we can choose to not go to people who don't talk to us mm -hmm. and explain to us what's going on. Absolutely. We have a right to know and we, we need to understand how to speak up. But we also need to understand that there's a whole list of people who have gone to school for ages, mm -hmm. who have studied <laughs> this, right? <laughs> who have we, studied this at the basics for ages who <laughs> understand this. So when they're telling you something, you need to take that information and understand it. And if you don't understand what's happening, then have that back and forth. I, I, one of the things I tell patients all the time is, your doctor is your partner. Yes. Gone are the days of the pre patriarchal, yep, yep. right, doctor Where that someone says, is telling you, you do this. Looking, looking, kind of talking yeah, down Yeah, talking to you. down, yeah. right. Yeah. This is a negotiation. And I, I would always tell people, if this isn't working, I need you to come back and tell me. Mm -hmm. Because if it's not working, we need to figure it out. And it's little simple things, you know, like um, for people who could just heart failure in the water pills. What do you hear? I don't take my water mm -hmm. pill at night. Especially when I'm going out. You exactly, know, I'm going out, I, I got to go it. to the yeah. bathroom. Mm -hmm. too. And then you negotiate a different time, a different <laughs> schedule for them mm -hmm. to take it so that they get the benefits of the medicine without the side effects that impact their quality of life. So Absolutely. health literacy is about making sure that people understand what's going on, understand what they need to do, and understand how their lifestyle impacts their chronic disease. Yes. Okay. Yes. Most people don't understand if we, I told people this, and I used to have these arguments with my brother who's an attorney and some of his friends. If, if health insurance. You're not arguing with an attorney. Oh, absolutely. I was homework, so I, I argued with him. <laughs> but, you know, it used to be health insurance didn't even care about um, health club benefits. Mm. But now we have silver sneakers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And why is that important? Because if you don't have to pay, and you're, you're asking people who have limited resources as is to right. pay for something that should be free, physical activity should be free. Absolutely. Right? Uh, we're fortunate to live in a city with a lot of parks, right? But even still, there's always this fear that, okay, Am I going to, is something going to happen while I'm out? Will I fall? Mm -hmm. Who can I go? You want to have someone there to support you while you're trying to exercise. So I love silver sneakers. And mm -hmm. different health uh, facilities across the city, across this country, will take silver sneakers, right? So you can just, you know, once you're Medicare Advantage age, you can sign up for it and you can, you know, go and participate. Now, when you're younger, I get it. It's hard. But I tell people, you have to develop an accountability group. Right. If you start something, mm -hmm. whether it's any kind of nutritional or exercise lifestyle change, doing it on your own. If you can do it on your own, kudos. Most That's people amazing. can. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you get someone who's going to hold you accountable. Say, hey, mm -hmm. you didn't. You know, what about this? And so I tell people all the time on Facebook, one of the things we're doing is the squat and the abs challenge. I've seen that. Okay. Yes. So. But I'm not doing I it. I know, right? No. So no. I, I'm, I am doing it because I brought it up. <laughs> and so what I do to make myself accountable mm -hmm. is every day I've been videoing myself. And of course, it's getting oh, harder. We're on day uh -huh. four. Uh -huh. So today's our rest day, but I get back at it tomorrow. And I'm videoing myself and posting it on the private, private Facebook group. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody can see me looking crazy. But because that accountability, it motivates people, but then it also keeps you honest. Right. And right. I think that as a community, we got to get more accountable for each other. And I think we've just gotten away from having these conversations. You know, gone are the Sunday dinner, you know, debates over yes, things, right? Yes. So you just bring up, gosh, you bring up so many different <laughs> points. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know where to begin. But in terms of health literacy, just taking your health care and literally, no pun intended, yeah. 
you know, making it something that you understand, that you, uh, your health care needs, yes. whether you have high blood pressure or don't, just knowing about yourself, knowing about ways to uh, get healthy or to stay healthy, and that's the key. And one of the things that you talked about was accountability. Yes. You talked about just knowing uh, just the information um, and, you know, and just using that information to make your, you know, the, j just the best decisions that you possibly can. And also advocacy. Yes. And that's a big issue when it comes to, you know, just, you know, um, when people go to the doctor's office. One of the things that I do actually advise some of my patients is bring somebody else in. Have yes. another set of eyes and ears yes. so that, okay, maybe if, maybe if you didn't understand it, maybe someone else could understand it or maybe I need to explain it differently. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that, but you also mentioned talking with your doctor, but you know, how do you do that in 10 minutes? Well, you know, how do you have that back and forth? Right. So telemedicine, yes. but also like the patient portal. So if you could kind of talk a little bit about, because we're talking about health literacy, but we also kind of are segueing Into and we may even have to telemedicine. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's this notion, I know that there's some confusion about telehealth and telemedicine. Yes. So telehealth mm -hmm. is just the broader term okay. where clinical and non-clinical services, it's like the broader umbrella about okay. how you can deliver services via telecommunications, right? Okay. But telemedicine is where you deliver clinical services via telecommunications. Oh, right? I see. So prior to the pandemic, you know this. I've been I've been screaming this for fifteen years now about mm -hmm. telemedicine. I've yeah. been trying to get. She people. has <laughs> years before. Let me see. This pandemic started around the end of twenty nineteen, <laughs> but I remember back in maybe twenty sixteen, her talking about telemedicine, I, and I specifically was like, mm, <laughs> "No, nope, I ain't doing that. I got to see someone in yeah. person." And she was screaming it from the rooftop. <laughs> So she is a very forward thinking. Yes. Yes. So thank, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean no, that. No, no, but yeah, what I, the telemedicine portion of it is just exploded over the pandemic mm -hmm. because now people see the utility of it. Yes. So I think that people underestimate the power of video conferencing and engagement. Mm -hmm. It can be just as personable as face to face. And you know, the one area where it has really grown is in behavioral health. And that's, that's what we need. Yeah, because yeah. they nobody yeah. wants the stigma. Yes. Okay. Yes. So if you can have this very discreet conversation, why wouldn't you do it? So it's exploded, and in fact, my company that I work for has been tremendously successful and was able to not only grow but double the size of their company, such that we're now the largest Medicare Advantage company in the U.S. Because they pivoted in the winter of 2020 to telemedicine just like wow. that. Wow. Because they had the forethought to get an EHR, they had video conferencing and telemedicine capability in there. And I bet you this young lady from West Louisville <laughs> may have had something to do with that. I would wow. like to take credit for that, oh. but I can't. I think telemedicine, there's been so many advocates, mm -hmm. but I think they just had the forethought to think about it. And this EHR had the forethought of And EHR stands it. for? Uh, electronic, electronic Health, health Record, yep. right? We want to make sure that we're, yes, we're completely literate. Yeah. yeah, and I want to I, I advocate for having physicians involved mm -hmm. in any mm -hmm. decision that may impact a patient care, whether it's someone developing a patient portal, EHR, because we can tell you whether or not this is useful to the patient. Right, right. right. Because, because we're in it. We're, we're in, in the it. trenches. We're, we and understand. We yes, yes. And, and what's so great about this is you're now in a sophisticated network of electronic health records where you can do the video. You have your, your knowledge of, of the patient's uh, condition in the health records. Mm -hmm. But you can, with the button, order all of their medicines and send it to the pharmacy. For electronically. To, electronically. And they can get it within get it seconds. It within seconds. Wow. It, okay. So no longer are we writing out prescriptions and, they take it and then taking it to the pharmacy mm -hmm. or faxing it over or doing whatever. It's all going through electronically. Exactly. And wow. here's the other thing that's really even better. We are now in a phase where pre-authorization pains will go away. They have now mm -hmm. opened up the connections such that data can now come together for pre-authorization so that back and forth, the delaying cares that comes with, well, I don't know if this cardiologist is in network and all that. Right. Electronics, telemedicine, telehealth, 
all of this data has become such a uh, blessing in helping us to construct mm -hmm. networks that are actually patient centric, mm -hmm. right? Because this is a, a very important thing. We've lost uh, focus. We've lost focus on the fact that the patient is most important, yes. not how much we generate. Yes, yes. Okay, money is never really yes. the issue. Patients over profit. Yep. Way mm -hmm. over yep. profit. Yep. Patients over everything. Everything. Right? Yep. Even over doctors' egos. Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. you know, the patient comes first. Yeah. I mean, you know, like patients yep. come first. And I always tell people, because I do leadership training now, like if you focus on the patient, you will never go wrong. Right. Okay. If you focus on the patient, you will always be kind and compassionate and patient because you will always understand mm -hmm. that all of this noise is why we have right. jobs is job security wow oh my <laughs> we obviously can talk about this for another hour <laughs> i have I, I literally have a list of different questions that i didn't even get a chance to get to because this conversation is you know That's okay. there's you so know much I'll come back anytime. yeah so we're gonna have to have you to come back absolutely but thank you so much thank you for one thing i always have to ask one question um one last question on the healthy mind body and spirit we talk about you know all these different concepts on being healthier mm -hmm. but what do you dr hill ali do to maintain your own health well Give us i i secrets. i do uh, a few things religiously other than prayer mm -hmm. okay um, I do meditate. I do okay. yoga. Okay. I get massages. Oh, okay, okay. Religiously. Okay. Okay. Like I've even got my husband into this, right? Because it's just something very magical about somebody squeezing the tension out of your yes. muscles, right? Maybe a little bit of anti-inflammatory. Very anti-inflammatory. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Relaxing. Mm -hmm. And then I have a personal trainer. Um, is the personal trainer the one that is getting you to do the squat? Uh, no, I chose that on my own, oh. and probably when he oh. hears this, he's going to be like, oh, Dr. Ali, so you're <laughs> doing the quad challenge. His name is Randall Pickett. Okay. He's out on Barstown Road. Um, okay. He's got a... I need a, to get his number. Yes, he's yeah. a black-owned yeah. group um, in uh, One Stop Fitness. He's gotten me and my daughter together, and it's been fun, and I drink lots of water. Okay, okay. okay. So I eat a balanced diet. I try to stay away from fats, but I'm a sugaraholic, and I have to have some sugar every day. Okay, So okay. I just make sure it's something contained. Something small, <laughs> something not a small. huge, not like something. those uh, Krispy Kreme donuts. No, I'm going to stay okay. away. Okay. I'm going to okay. pretend like I don't see those, <laughs> but I have like a little thing of yogurt and maybe a little, you know, a little cookie or something, but I have to have something to reward myself. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> wow. Well, obviously, at 50, look. I mean, really? <laughs> I think the genetics. Yeah, like, well, yeah, right. Right. Mom and parents. dad did a great <laughs> job. But I think you also, you know, with all the different things that you have going on, amazing. Thank you. And all this in West Louisville. Yes, from West great Louisville. Great things come from West from Yes, West they Louisville. do. And West people don't know this. Side. She was my parents' doctor, mm -hmm. okay? And when I tell you she has mm -hmm. been a friend and an advocate and a sister, mm -hmm. thank you for that service. Oh, well, I appreciate you. We, we need to get together. Yes, we you know, do. We need to get together, stay together, and it you know, really is all about community and it's yes. all about love. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of times we talk about, you know, we're talking about West Side and all mm -hmm. these so-called bad things that happen, but there are some beautiful things yes. that happen, have happened, and will continue to happen in West Louisville. Yes. When we work together, when we come together, yes. we can make amazing things happen. Absolutely. So, and this is an amazing episode of Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit right here in West Louisville, West Side, the Best Side, with Dr. Hill Ali. Thank you so Thank much. You. We're definitely going to have to have you come back. I will come back There's so much anytime. information. We just couldn't go over everything. So thank you for joining us for this episode, and be well.